Namaskar, this is Neela Man Singh Chaudhary from Chandigarh. I thank you very much for your patience. There have been tremendous technical glitches which I hope will now allow us, which are behind us and will allow us to go further and have a real conversation and a dialogue between you and my invisible audience. Um, Today, that whole term has become so powerful and has, had so, and has so many different connotations and so many different interpretations that it can boggle the mind. Today, when we talk about uh, navigating space, we're actually navigating even our lives. When we practice social distancing, physical distancing, and as we all know, theater is a space of intimacy. It is a space of touch, of contact. It's a space of smell. It's a space of breathing in and breathing out, where a group of people come together as a collective and participate and interact with each other. Now, after the COVID, how will the whole thing change? There are going to be enormous changes, but I think those changes can be seen as challenges rather than impediments or limitations. We do not know, we can only conjecture. There could be some hy hypothesis that one can build on, but those will be abstract constructions which have no meaning in the present moment. It is only through trial and error, it is only through experimentation that we will figure out and understand what kind of new spaces evolve in this new changing health and physical environment which we may inhibit six months or five months or one year from now. I think theatre will never, never die. Theatre will always be a very powerful expression of human interaction. Because what theatre offers and what the performance arts offer is so special. It is that special energy that passes by what the actor is experiencing and emoting on the stage with a live audience, that invisible thread which he unleashes and binds a separate group of people in one cohesive collective entity. What is that invisible thread? What is that sutra? That sutra which binds people coming from different social, political, emotional, intellectual backgrounds into one cohesive whole is the magic that makes us gravitate towards theatre despite all the odds, despite all the limitations, despite all the hardships. Um, my journey in theatre has been really a series of accidents. I was born and brought up in Amritsar. I came from a middle class family where theatre could be seen as a hobby but never as a profession. By accident, I met Ibrahim al Qazi, who was the director of the National School of Drama at that time. I was a student in Chandigarh and uh, I started doing some theatre at the university, not because I had some great burning passion for the arts. It was to make life more interesting. Because in the university, when you're doing a... I was doing a course in art history under a wonderful teacher who was heading the department called Dr. B. and Goswami. Uh, working with him and working and, and being a student at the university meant that I was occupied for two hours or three hours of the day. So to make life more interesting and to get away from that boredom of not knowing what to do with the rest of the day, I decided to join the University Theatre uh, Club, as they called it in those days. And we did plays like Antigone and we did plays like uh, um, The Maids by Jean Genet, Jean Onoui. We did a play called Gagan Methal. So somewhere I liked the whole smell and the whole feeling and the whole energy that theatre seems to suggest. But I had no idea about the contours of the business. Till I met Ibrahim al Ghazi. He came to Chandika. He brought two plays from the National School of Drama, um, Jasma Oren, which was done by Shanta Gandhi, and another play called uh, Othello by Shakespeare, which we all are well versed with. And I remember Manohar Singh, the legendary actor, was doing the role of Othello and M.K. Raina was doing the role of Iago. And I was so mesmerized and so overwhelmed by the, by the intellectual rigor, by the uh, visual language, by the, 
the whole professionalism of it because I always thought the arts was that you had a feeling and you had an emotion and you found a space and you and you went for it I never thought that theatre was also taught that theatre was also a technique and then I understood that when we call the the uh, the artist, the Shilpakar, he's a craftsman. So craft is a very essential part, or technique as we call it, a very essential part of the whole training of what it means to be an actor. Because talent is like raw material. It has to be chiseled, it has to be refined, it has to be made to grow. And that can only be done in a professional environment. And I was very fortunate that I had a master like Ibrahim al Qazi who taught us about detailing, about characterization, and told us that art is hard. And it is not a hobby. It is a profession which has to be taken as seriously as if you wish to be a doctor or a lawyer. And then I, much later when I read Anne Bogart, you know, the wonderful teacher who teaches in the University of Columbia, where she said the three things you need to be an artist. You need passion, you must have a story to tell, the urge to share, to connect, to communicate, and you must have technique. So technique becomes a very essential dimension that gives a certain structure to your passion and also to your storytelling techniques. We are always telling stories, how we sit, how we eat, how we interact with people, what we say, how we dress, we are all telling a story. How we live, the aesthetics that we choose to surround ourselves by, they all tell a story. And how those stories are transformed and translate into a performance space is what I would like to share with you. I, after my three years at the National School of Drama, I went and worked in Bhopal. It was all some wonderful, uh, what you would say, um, uh, um, wonderful twists and turns of destiny. My husband had got a posting in Bhopal, and that is the time Bharat Bhavan was coming up, which is a multi-arts complex, where B.V. Karanth was invited to, to look after the Hindi repertory company, which was being set up in Bharat Bhavan, which was called the Rang Mandal. And I was offered a job in the Rang Mandal, and it was really a life-altering experience for me to be, to have been, uh, to, to have had the good fortune to experience and to understand the working processes of two masters, a master like al Qazi Sahab, and on the other hand, B.V. Karanth who came from the Gubbi Theatre Company from Karnataka, learnt uh, the Yakshagana, learnt music from Amkarna Thakur, was... Um, I mean, I remember Karanji telling me that I national struggle to take a So I said, what should I do to feel that I want to participate in the whole spirit of nationalism? This is the time when we were talking about freedom and about India becoming independent. He said, I will learn Hindi. Seekunga. So for that, he went to the Banaras Hindu University and learned how to speak, write, and did a master's in Hindi. Then after that, he went and joined the National School of Drama, also was a student of Alkazi. So we shared a common platform of being taught by an iconic teacher like Alkazi. So to come back, uh, Bharat Bhavan was a very important experience for me. I worked with Karanji for four and a half years and had an association with him that lasted till the time he died in 2002. When I came to Chandigarh, I set up my own theatre company called The Company. And I do know that I was convinced that whatever work I do, which was something I learned by my experience of working with B.V. Karanth was that whatever you, whatever work you do, it must have local moorings. It must be vernacular in sensibility and it must be regional. So these three dimensions became very integral to my whole sense of playmaking, of creating a performance. It had to be vernacular, it had to be regional and it had to be local. So I cobbled together a group of actors, 
and what is interesting is i had a group of actors musicians who came from the nakal tradition and i had actors who came from drama departments and drama schools or who had worked with local uh, amateur groups in chandigarh and we put a company together and it was a very interesting dynamics to see how two separate groups of people coming from different worlds economic social educational even in terms of training could make a play together what is this what is this combustion what is this what is this um, uh, commingling that produces a certain kind of work now when i worked with the folk artists the nakals um, nakal comes from the persian word to imitate who are funsters they are the ad lib they um, they can improvise uh, uh, they they do productions which seem to disturb any notions that you may have or what is a play and what is not a play now for example when um, um uh, i went when i followed their work and i saw that um during ram leela they would the female impersonators would uh, dance and in ravan ke darbar and say jhumka gira re ravan ke darbar mein so it was very interesting to see this commingling of pan indian myths combined with local myths transformed and renewed for local meaning the gods that they evoked rode bicycles aspired for a maruti 800 and also sweated profusely when sohini travels on the matka to meet uh, mehwal the matka becomes also a character animates itself and says you know i'm kachcha but that's the way the playwright has written uh, the play so sohini says well you i know your kachcha i'm going to sit on you and when we go down the river you're going to melt and dissolve in the water and i'm going to drown but if that's the way the story is going to unfold let's go for it and i thought to myself these are such sophisticated techniques of performance making this is what bertolt brecht talked about this is what the greek theater was talking about where right in the beginning the chorus announces that the that the hero is going to die so already you know the end before the play unfolds and to see in a starlit night thousands and thousands of people sitting together watching a performance where something precious and something really meaningful and exciting was being exchanged suddenly dissolved all my sense of what theater should be or should not be what are what is theater and what is not theater suddenly was thrown into the garbage can because i was i did theater in the 70s early 80s was when i entered into a, a, a so called semi professional space where we sat in proscenium theaters sitting next to strangers not exchanging a word not even looking at them and suddenly suddenly to see a play where the the actors invade your space and you can invade their space seems like all lines as this as puck said the lines have dissolved seemed like a very exciting new theatrical form to explore and it was a grammar and a vocabulary which was not evident in the the realistic theater performances that i had been exposed to or i had seen during my times as a student in drama schools and if and even otherwise so this in a certain way uh, twisted something in my own mind and when i set up my own company initially i did what you would call a well made play i took plays of ibsen and lorca and uh, i did girish karnat's nagamandala which is very special to my heart uh, we did that three times on the behest of uh, girish karnat but i found that maybe it was something intuitive that every time i did nagamandala i sort of tossed the script around even when i did a classical play i brought it to the now because i feel that theater belongs to the now it belongs to the present even though each play especially a classical play carries within it the baggage of the time in which it was written i made it travel i made it travel culturally geographically language wise uh 
and through that whole process made the play my own because I really believed that I really do believe and this may not go down very well with playwrights that once a play is written and comes in the public domain it transforms itself from a literary text into a performative text and the performative text belongs to the director because we all know that the same play done by four directors will be done differently there is no single way of doing a play just like there is no single interpretation there is no not also a single response so to come back you know in the beginning i was doing what you would call a well made play but somewhere in the i would say in the early 2000 i suddenly started feeling restless and wanted to challenge myself i wanted to um i i sort of intuitively rejected what you would call the well made play this is not a judgment it is just a preference a preference that i had so i started taking an idea and developing that idea and i i would like to also interrupt the flow of my thoughts and tell you that i work with one of the leading poets in punjab called surjit patar and we've had a wonderful collaboration for so many years so i give him a certain thought and idea and how he transforms translates structures and makes it into a living living entity is the miracle of working with a man of such incredible such with such a incredible genius and then i worked with bv karan for 22 years and how he could translate the words of a poet into such wonderful musical lyrics and such wonderful musical scores so then i started doing plays which became more collaborative i started occupying you know the word director as we know at least for me has a resonance which is very uh, which has to do with control which has to do with masculinity which has to do with authority but suddenly i wanted the play to belong to me and the actors and the designers and the musicians so authorship was distributed so the whole uh, process that i uh, started working on was called was based on improvisation where a certain idea a seed of an idea i mean it's, i do come slightly empty into a rehearsal space but within that emptiness there is a there's a urge that i want to talk about certain issues certain things not as an activist but as a creative artist so you know whether it's about gender whether it's about lost homelands whether it is about migration whether it is about um um deforestation whatever i'm concerned about at that point and we we discuss and we talk and uh, uh, so the ideas planted to the students and like i'll tell them the last play i did was called gum hai which has a certain text it was based on a text an aboriginal text called the seven stages of grieving and i tell the actors that um um uh what does protest mean to you how would you manifest protest which is an abstract idea protest is very it's it's not definitive it could be protest about khana acha nahi bistar acha nahi kamra acha nahi pankha chitre nahi chal raha or it can also be something more noble and more national and more uh, political or more social so you you deal with certain ideas what does protest mean to you what does loss mean to you what does gender mean to you what does equality mean to you so through a process of releasing an idea into a rehearsal space the actor then comes up un- unlocks his own imagination in ways which i think he surprises himself as brecht would say surprised surprised by the familiar that he surprises himself so we've had some really wonderful kind of um uh, results that have that have been pulled out through this kind of exercise where sometimes what the trigger that i give the actor what he produces is far removed from what i had imagined sometimes it comes very much like a blueprint to what i had thought i wish to Uh, plan in the play and sometimes i'm surprised by what the unexpected surprised by the unfamiliar 
so then the whole question of weaving and uh, stitching and making a performance takes a long time we may imagine that this kind of working is much more fear but it really isn't because you have nothing to hold on to you have no text to hold on to you never know when the how, the moment you never know what the starting point is you never know what the ending point is all this is a entire process of churning chiseling hammering um um rejecting um uncertainty it's all about uncertainty but in a certain way through this process i feel a true and meaningful dialogue happens between the director and the actors this does not mean that the actors function is different from mine or my function as a director is dissolved into nothingness i think we all recognize the space which which is the because we do know that the actors are the real arbiters of the stage they are the masters of the stage they are the ones through whose body voice emotion the ideas will be made manifest so um i find this the new way of working which i do and i'm sure a lot of other directors also work in a similar way and in a because i do feel that a rehearsal space is not about control it's not about authority it's about a group of people coming together breathing responding it's about being intuitive it's about being instinctive it's about trusting uh, the absurd the illogical and making it work um i don't know what kind of time i have and i can see a couple of things that are coming down yeah yes i think this is very true um Uh, it's a critical time for chakresh kumar thank you very much i think we have really been failed by our um by our funding bodies by our funding agencies uh, by the academies by the ministry of culture there has been absolutely nothing that has been done for the artist the artist i know there are so many causes today there's there's about when you see you, the 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 sight which will haunt us forever and will definitely somewhere translate into the the work that we make is the image of thousands of people workers going home hungry exhausted swollen feet swollen hearts it's a image that will haunt us forever in the same way they are i was talking to a friend of mine and she was saying how many lawyers are starving so i think every profession has been hit whether it's a restaurant business whether it is the uh, construction business whether it is the entertainment business but i am only at the moment i'm concerned about this very large picture but my immediate connection is with my fellow artist i think i i think that they are you know they they are also like daily wage earners this they 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 work in the morning and they eat in the evening whether they do street plays or they do performances because theater as we know when we make the choice is uh, is a is a profession fraught with uncertainty it's fraught with financial stress whether it is a young person trying to run a company or someone who's run a company for 35 years like i have i think i think our situation is quite the same uh, money is always a stress point and at that point for the government which has a ministry of culture there is a ministry of culture which has been set up for moments like this and not to hear the voice of the artists the folk artists the traditional artists the the city artists the urban artists i think it is really really disturbing no matter what kind of voice you you know how lo- loud your voice m- may be it doesn't seem to reach anywhere it's like it's like singing in the wilderness there's nobody listening there's nobody hearing so these are very deeply um, uh, deep uh, areas of concern i mean how much can a individual keep on collecting money it's a very exhausting task it's not easy people's funds also dry up so i think this is definitely something which needs to be take cognition of i don't know if anyone from the ministry would ever listen to a talk which i'm giving and um 
uh, though I do believe that no matter how savage the times may be, we must never lo lose hope. Because theatre offers us, in these segregated times, a space for being, for being a collective, for being together. And I think that is a very significant dimension of what, why people choose to be in a, to be in a space like theatre, because it's about community. It's about helping you to take decisions in life. It's about focus. It's about concentration. And I think the groups, the young groups that we have in the city, they're doing fantastic work. And why I say it's fantastic, not only in the city, but whether it's in Calcutta or Bombay or Batinda or Moga, all over. Why I feel it's fantastic is because they are uniting a group of young people, exposing them to a world of ideas, keeping them off the streets, the giri route or from drugs or from drinking, and putting them in a, in a world where they can express, where they can communicate, where they can share stories. So I think, uh, I think it's really unfortunate and I can only commiserate and say that we are all part of this stress and let's hope we can stand united and manage this monolithic, um, uh, unknown, invisible uh, power, which is uh, the, the, the minister of... I've done um, Nagamandala three times and it was the first time I did it and I must say it was in uh, it was in 89 when it had not even been published. I wrote to Girish Karnad. He was a very good friend of B.V. Karanth. So I'd met him, but I had not done any work of any consequence. I wrote to him and I said, I introduced myself and I said, I would really love to do your play. And I must say that man and his generosity and his belief and his faith was so overwhelmingly um, special that he sent me a handwritten script of Nagamandala in English. And of course, Pataji translated it. And then Girish Karnad and B.V. Karant um, Toured, arranged an entire tour of Karnataka where we performed in Bangalore, Mysore, Hedugu, Udupi. And what was so exciting for me was that in the book that he published for the first time of Nagamandala, the pictures on the cover were from my play. So the f then in, 19, uh, in 2004, he asked me if I could revive Nagamandala. There is no such thing as a revival in theatre. Uh, theatre is at the now, in the now. It's born today, it dies at night. I don't think you can revive a play. There can't be a retrospective of theatre because the whole language of performance changes so fast. The vocabulary, the emotional thrust of the actor, the, the, the inner choreography of the soul and the spirit, it changes in a, in a way which is so quick and so fast that one has to keep on... Um, uh, that that um, uh, sorry, I, I got a little placard from the organizers, so I went off somewhere. Um, so um, but in 2004, I had to rethink. I told uh, Girishji if I could look at the play again because I wanted to know if the play still spoke to me, and I was amazed because it is one of the most incredible play written in Indian playwriting, where the abstract, the illusionary the real, they mix and they overlap in a celebration of so many elements that what we think or what we imagine, why should that be less real than the fact that I'm talking to you? Moments of love, moments of happiness, do they really happen or do we imagine them? So this whole, you know, imagine having a chorus of flames. What happens when the light switches off? What happens, where does the light go? Such an abstract, metaphysical uh, kind of question. And because I worked with the Nakals, who, which has a very strong element of the female impersonator, uh, I know there's a question where somebody wishes me to talk a little more about the Nakals, which I will do in half a minute. So in 2004, I did the play again, reworking it, rechanging it. And, you know, he's given two endings 
to Nagamandala, which is again a very Brechtian thing. One is, and you can choose as a playwright which ending, uh, as a as a director, which ending you want to use. You can also decide if you want to use both the endings. I chose I chose one of the more tragic ending, where the snake dies. You know, it's a, the snake is as you know is the metaphor in the play. The snake, as you know, also represents desire. It represents awakening. Uh, it represents Adam and Eve. You know, it's got the snake has so many, uh, so many uh, meanings and so many different um, um, cultural uh, myth mythologies. So I explored all of them to create this whole sense of what the snake image really means in this play Nagamandala. So I think uh, it worked very well uh, the second time as well and Girish she was obviously quite happy with the new production and it becomes very difficult because you know most of the cast was the same, the music was the same, it was designed by B.B. Karanth. Some of the cast had changed but I had to recast the music, I had to recast some of the images and the movements and make it afresh. Then in 2014 he once again asked me to do Nagamandala, 10 years later. Now by this time, you know, I've, I'd also grown 10 years older. I've, I've, I was a little more irreverent towards the script. My actors had become older, so I could not show um, Rani as a, as a sweet little young coy bride. I had to show her, I had to interpret her differently according to the age and according to her alertness to what it means to be a woman who's looking forward to her wedding bed. So, uh, and every time I did Nagamandala, I discovered new things. This is what makes a classical play, that it lends itself to multiple interpretations at multiple times in your life. There was something about, more about the Nakals. When I started working with the Nakals, there's a little backstory to it. When I worked in Bharat Bhavan with B.V. Karanth, at that time there was a lot of uh, talk about uh, finding your own way of training actors. Because most drama schools that existed, including the Fountainhead School, National School of Drama, most of the, me most of the methods of training were based on Stanislavski. It was based on speech, it was based on uh, detailing, it was based on characterization, very important tools of training nevertheless. But they felt that they wanted to find a system that was more suited to the Indian body. I think it was, it started somewhere by the Sangeet Natak Academy which started this whole concept of theatre of roots by Dr. Suresh Avasti, where a certain amount of money was given to certain groups and, and they were told that why don't you work with your local uh, f folk traditions and do a play? Now, you know, money can be a problematic thing because when you have a grant which seems to have certain uh, conditions, then a lot of very spurious notions of what is tradition, what does the past mean, what does the present mean, come into play. And there is... Uh, uh, and also you... I was very conscious that if I start working uh, with the traditional form, uh, it shouldn't be because of exotica. It shouldn't be used as a liet motive. It has to be organic, it has to be internal, it has to be dovetailed in a manner where what does it mean to be a rural actor, what does it mean to be an urban actor? It's really two groups of people bringing different skills and trying to collate those skills together Ek mission karna, jisme ek dusre ke jo training processes hai, creates a third kind of way of working. It creates a third way of working. Now, this ideas, everybody uses, you know, ideas are dime a dozen. You, you can work with a master like B.V. Karanth, which I did. But when I come and do my own work, then I have to find my own language. I have to find my own way of working. I can't be a copy of a copy of a copy. So, when we were in Bharat Bhavan, as you know, Madhya Pradesh has a very rich folk tradition. So, we were working with master performers and actors who were members of the repertory, the Rang Mandal, which was, uh, which was organized in Bharat Bhavan in Bhopal. They didn't come from drama schools, they didn't come from the NST. They were all people who had local theatre. When 
उन्होंने वहाँ रंगमंडल में दे वर सेलेक्टेड फॉर द विपट्री दे वर वेरी स्टिफ यू नो दे वर नेचुरली वेरी सेल्फ कॉन्शियस लाइक वी ऑल आर वेन वी जॉइन ड्रामा स्कूल हमने देखा दैट द मोमेंट यू पुट दम इन टच विद द मास्टर परफॉर्मर से द नाचा ट्रेडिशन और द राय बरेदी ट्रेडिशन मध्य प्रदेश में तो भंडार है इट्स सच अ रिच रिच काइंड ऑफ ट्रेडिशन ऑफ फोक परफॉर्मेंसेज द मोमेंट यू पुट दीज टू टूगेदर सडनली द एक्टर हु सो स्टेफ इज बॉडी ओपन अप ही कुड he could move he could express because all the blocks that he had in in within him the blocks which we thought were of the body but they are actually blocks of the imagination the moment you unlock the body you unlock the imagination when we teach in drama school students how to do yoga how to do kalari how to do kuriyattam how to do kathakali it is not to make them into kathakali artists or to make them into uh, kuriyattam artists but how to understand and control their body in such a way that by controlling their body they also unleash or release their blocked emotions uh, um, so i think i loved that experiment i loved the, that exploration we started doing these programs called purva rang jahan roz roz sham ko darshak aate the and uh, दे कुड सी वॉट द एक्ट इज एट डन बिकॉज जैसे नाट्य शास्त्र में लिखा है कि पूर्व रंग भी दर्शकों के सामने होना चाहिए दैट इवन द ट्रेनिंग एंड द प्रैक्टिस प्रैक्टिस ऑफ एन एक्टर शुड बी डन बिफोर एन ऑडियंस इट्स नॉट अ प्राइवेट स्पेस द मोमेंट यू बिकम अ परफॉर्मर यू ऑलरेडी एंटर्ड इन टू अ पब्लिक स्पेस विच इज द स्पेस ऑफ योर को एक्टर्स योर डायरेक्टर्स योर डिजाइनर्स हु एवर इज देयर इन द इनिशियल स्टेजेस so when i came to chandigarh i wanted to somewhere explore the same possibilities and i was used to be very uh, i've said this before on another platform but i'd like to repeat it i used to always feel very disturbed when i used to see hindi films and i would see um, uh, punjabi spoken in a funny language i'm talking about the 80s i'm even talking about the 90s now of course sing is king and you have kesari and you have uh, akshay kumar you know doing all kinds of you know where the sardar has become uh, a very valid component of uh, um, hindi cinema but during the 80s the sikh was never the lover he was never the hero he was always the truck driver and i thought to myself i've heard such beautiful gurmukhi is being spoken in my own home the entire guru granth sahib is spoken in uh, spoken in punjabi your entire sufiana kalam then you have such wonderful poets you know uh, rather than go into long history Uh, of Bhai Veer Singh and all that. Look at Surjit Patar, Pash, Shiv Kumar Batalvi, and many more. Chandan, you know, इतने हमारे जबरदस्त पंजाबी के कवि हैं. Why has this image distortion or language distortion taken place? And then, um, uh, you know, this whole balle balle culture that we laugh about and talk about. I wanted to actually work in the Punjabi language. And in that whole process, I did Roshamon. with the department of indian theater guru sawa's film where i used the whole um uh, martial arts tradition of the gatka of the nihangs uh, so i was also you know coming back to punjab after so many years for me it was also a journey into my own language into my own what you would call my own regionalism because language is not only words it's not only sound it's cultural history it's imagery it's idiom it is emotion it is smell it's hundreds of little things that make language it's your politics it's your humor it's your gali karna you know so um, language is a very integral part in the moment you do a lorka play in punjabi wo lorka ban jata hai punjabi playwright in a certain way working with female impersonators made me relook at gender on the stage what does it mean to be a woman on stage what does it mean to be a man on the stage is gender a create a performative construct or is it biology you know um my grandparents lived in a gurdwara 
they lived in they, we had a big gurdwara in rawalpindi which after the division of the country was naturally left behind so compensatory land was given to my grandparents in uh, chandigarh so we had a good so i have always been very fascinated by this whole thing of collective cooking because the langar concept is so essential to the sikh religion and being a sikh i have spent uh, every holiday was going to the golden temple and doing seva and making atte ke balls and gunwing and uh, then my gur, the, the gurdwara in chandigarh be we slept uh, in the gurdwara and subah subah uth ke atta gunna dal chonkna uh, roti banana um, parosna so that ho and you know it was you know women sharing stories the community a feeling that is generated in a kitchen so i wanted to do a play about food and women uh, so i asked uh, uh, surjit patra that let's do a play about food and women he said what is the script i said the script is basically it's set in a kitchen and i want the play to have the smell of coriander the sense of peace wo atta pisna chonkna and he said well then i need a karchi rather than a pen to write the play anyway in that whole dialogue that we were having i came across, i started reading text so i came across this wonderful play by laura esquel called uh, like water for chocolate and another one by isabel ayendi called um, aphrodite so i took those text and i gave it to him underlined it took certain portion because both these plays are so much connected with uh, what you would call um, uh, latin america and about the whole sense of a woman's place in the, the the dynamics of a patriarchal system or a matriarchal system so they were very much located in their own regional cultural history so how you make it travel how you transform it how it translated became quite an exciting journey so we had this whole kitchen which we set up and what is interesting is bv karan throughout the uh, did all the musical compositions and he used all the sounds of the kitchen the pisna the pitna the chakki the chutney banana the the chonkna uh, of course along with the tabla and the tumbi and other musical instruments and i remember people saying that did you have cooks because the jalebis were being made and uh, uh, and um, uh, pakoras were being made and they were distributed to the audience and what is interesting is that all the songs were recipes they were recipes of how to make pakoras but it also went into rab da naam and uh, pyar naal banai but uh, you know everything has to be made with love and how much you put it so you know recipes in a way kind of uh, jaunty musical kind of way uh, were written by patar ji so we had 10 gas cylinders on the stage and all the actors are cooking stories are being shared and it is a story of this one woman who talks about many issues you know i won't go into that but it was a very interesting play it showed me the possibilities of the stage where you can have a show in germany and in japan and all over the world using 10 gas cylinders uh, where food is cooked where food is served where the actors where the audience are not passive uh, participants but become active participants in the whole development of the show so kitchen katha was really quite uh, a daring and i don't know maybe i was younger so i took those kind of risks i wonder if i would be able to do a kitchen katha today since the last um, since the last couple of years i've been very fascinated by working with sadat hasan monto i think he's one of the greatest story short story writers that i have read um whatever he said during the time of the division of the country is as relevant at this moment as it was then he was a humanist he saw plumbed the depth of human misery and human savagery in a manner which i think no other short st- story writer has been able to do and what i find so fascinating is that no matter how hard the times no matter how terrible the times he talked about he never forgot the essential humanity of human nature he managed to pull that out no matter how brutal the times 
that he talked about and the very fact that he wrote them already showed that there was affirmation okay how much real can an actor be on stage now you know uh, very often i'm asked that everything that i do on stage is real and yet i do not deal do realistic plays if i cook food on the stage it's real food food if i'm going to serve the audience i can't i can't serve them kachcha khana so the success of a play is also based on how tasty the food is that you cook and the timing of the play has to also follow the timing of the cooking that is required so the choreography and the precision is of a different kind altogether the fact of the matter is that the actors had also got to be taught that when they eat and speak they must have a understanding of their digestive system so this play actually worked on many many uh, new ways of training the actor how to eat and speak how to play and cook when i even though the play i now i get the question even though the play is all about food and cooking it is still dealing with the world of it is not realistic it is not within the space of realism and this is a question i ask myself over and over again that if i i tell the actors if you write a letter you don't just scribble because you feel nobody is going to read it you must write what you're supposed to write because the truth of the action will lead to the truth of the emotion if you have to do pocha and you actually do the pocha properly then somebody your emotional graph will also become real so the rice you eat on the stage the rice and the dal you eat on the stage or the chai that you make on the stage it has to be made in real time even though the context can be completely abstract and be surreal as you call it and i'm sure this is a great uh, bit of work that uh, Uh, you all are doing uh, the coconut theater and i wish you all the best and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to interact with all of you many many thanks namaskar